By today, it is a common place to state that the serious academic study of esotericism has grown in importance, at least since the middle of the 20th century. While in the pre-modern world, up to the end of the 17th century, such topics as alchemy, astrology, angelology and magic were natural ingredients of the organic world picture, since the Enlightenment these fields of inquiry have become constituents of anti-rationalist counterculture or sensational topics for the romantic imagination. 19th century positivistic scholarship started rediscovering Western esotericism by collecting and publicizing documents and data with no or condescending value judgments. All this became backed by Max Weber's famous dictum about disenchantment, expecting that irrationalism and even religion will disappear with the advance of secularization, rationalism and science. By now we know that this has not happened and will not in the future. Today we are already deeply permeated with the resurrected interest in the transcendental, called re-enchantment by sociologists, scholars of religious studies and cultural historians. By the beginning of the present millennium, several dedicated departments were established to study Western esotericism, as this term gradually replaced the previously used Hermeticism. In order to provide a forum for the strictly scholarly research of this wide-ranging topic, the founding of the European Society for the Study of Western Esotericism, ASWI, was instrumental in 2005. ASWI has been flourishing ever since, holding a major international conference every two years. The development of ASWI has importantly inspired such investigations in East Central as well as Eastern European countries. It would be exaggeration to say that this was the single one source of motivation, but without doubt, the internationally open and embracing research attitude of ASWI helped to channel and concentrate previously sporadical studies. The growing importance of East Central Europe first transpired in 2011 when the third biennial conference of the society was hosted by the University of Szeged in Hungary. In spite of this prestigious achievement, East Central Europe still remains on the margins of the map of the study of Western esotericism. One reason for this may be the fact that the widely used Slavic and Hungarian languages of the region create a barrier for Western scholarship. And even when the actual academic publications are in English, the source materials point back to the same obscure languages, or at best, to German. This might discourage many mainstream scholars. In the upcoming short video, I'm delighted to introduce two young scholars who represent two different and relevant research fields relating to the influence of modern esotericism in Hungary. Dr. Julia Dimeshi is a psychologist and historian of psychology, while Dr. Marton Vespremi is a historian, a librarian and a philologist whose interest focuses on astrology let it be an early modern pursuit or something that has inspired important 20th century Hungarian intellectuals. Uh, good afternoon, Yuli. Good afternoon, Marton. I'm very glad that you accepted my invitation and I'm very much looking forward to this little conversation about your topics. These are very serious research topics which uh, focus on different areas of Hungarian cultural and uh, and scientific life, but connected to Western esotericism. And of course, that's the main question that how does it connect it and why do you think it's re a relevant research field? Uh, Yuli, would you mind starting? Yeah, of course. Well, um, I'm very much interested in the history of psychology and uh, 
Uh, actually, uh, the influence of esotericism, Western esotericism on psychology, it's a rather ignored field within the history of uh, psychology. Um, uh, even though there are very obvious links between psychology and esoteric thinking, especially if we are taking into uh, account the history, the broad history of, uh, of, of, of psychological thinking and especially psychoanalysis. So uh, in my research, uh, usually I focus on historical questions uh, regarding the intersection between psychology and esotericism. Uh, I'm very much interested in psychoanalysis and the history of psychoanalysis. And this is quite an obvious field of interaction here because it's rather easy to, to identify, discover the, the, the links and the, the, the problems, issues behind the intersection section between psychology and um, esotericism. Uh, so I did some historical research on the esoteric uh, uh, historical antecedents of psychoanalytic thinking. And now oh, they... Interrupting, but when you mention this, everybody would immediately think of Jung. Uh, yes. Are we in Jung or beyond Jung or around Jung? How, how would you place Jung into a wider context in this respect? Yeah, I, that, that's a very important question. Th thank you so much. So yeah, Jung is an obvious example, but there are many more representatives of psychodynamic thinking who were very much involved in esotericism, or at least were interested in certain aspects of it. For example, in the old question of um, animal magnetizers on the nature of the healing relationship or in the questions of telepathy. So Freud was also interested in these topics, uh, but uh, his uh, student, uh, Sándor Ferenczi, the Hungarian Sándor Ferenczi, was also very much involved in, um, in, in, in the uh, early investigations of parapsychology, if I can use this term. And actually, he was a, a very well-known figure in the early uh, 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 Hungarian per psychological life, especially among spiritualists, animal magnetizers. Uh, uh, so he was treated, Ferenczi was treated as a kind of an expert by them uh, on in the border zone between um, psychology or psychoanalysis and spiritualism. So not only Jung, but there are many further uh, very important even figures, even founding fathers of psychology uh, uh, were involved uh, in, 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 in the investigation of uh, parapsychological states or, or further uh, topics connected to esotericism. Um, so the, the historical background here is uh, really very rich and we can identify many, many links. And nowadays, I started to focus much more on the contemporary manifestations of esotericism in psychology, because certain forms of um, esoteric uh, practices uh, and ideas were able to survive, or they had a kind of a lingering effect in this context. And in applied psychology, uh, especially uh, um, uh, uh, in the border zone of psychology and spirituality or esoteric uh, esotericism or new age, we can find some psychological practices uh, which are in fact uh, 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 can be understood as a, as a new or modern manifestations of, uh, of of some early or old esoteric ideas. And is it is it characteristic for Hungary as well or mostly abroad? Um, I would say both. Okay, we'll come back to these questions, but let's turn to Marton now. You, you are doing something quite different, nevertheless connected to esotericism. Can you summarize your research? Yes, um, my, uh, my field of research is um, the history of astrology in, in, uh, in 20th century Hungary, which is, is, uh, is quite a new um, field of research. As, as far as I know, I, I am the only um, one in this field. And um, <clears throat> um, it's also a challenging field um, because the, the history of astrology in 20th century Hungary is um, pretty much the history of astrologers. So 
so um, the the outcome is actually um, biographies of uh, of astrologers, and uh, and and um, the sources you um, you need to write. Uh, this are not found in state institutions, state uh, libraries or state um, archives, but these are private bequests that, that, that are in, in private hands. So, so firstly, you, you have to track down the owners, uh, the heirs somehow. And secondly, you have, to, um, um, you have to make them share the material with you, uh, which is not always easy. And, uh, and then if you have access to the material, um, referencing it is also not easy because there are no numbers, there are no shelf marks. So um, it's a challenging field. And um, one, um, one important um, aspect that I also found is that interviews are not very useful. I mean, interviews with, with living persons. Um, because they they don't don't remember the facts they don't remember the names they don't remember the dates or or they simply don't want to because they just want to forget the past and and not dwell on it at all um so so a historian needs uh, written written sources um there is also one <clears throat> one important type of written source uh that can be found in uh, state in the state institutions and um, those are the reports written by the hungarian communist secret services i think julia you also came across the secret service files to track down people yes yes in the case of uh, ferenc Völgyesi, actually the uh, hip hypnotizer can i call him like this yeah yeah the famous oh. yeah hypnotist and he was a, also an expert in animal hypnosis. Yeah. Uh, it was very interesting what Martin said about private circles, private bequests. Uh, is it also characteristic for psychologists that somehow not so public, not so institutional, but uh, private practitioners or something like this, and you have to dig into materials? Yeah, it can happen actually. Uh, but interestingly, uh, most of my sources are published sources. Uh, uh, the main problem with them is that they are not written in English. Uh, they are written in Hungarian or in German and, and therefore uh, they, they are not very well-known sources. But also, for example, uh, 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 letters from archives or, or, or uh, further documents can, can be extremely important, especially when I try to uh, reconstruct the history of Hungarian spiritualist movement uh, and the institutionalization of Hungarian spiritualism. Uh, in they, these cases, I usually use uh, archived um, sources. So, uh, but most of my sources are, are, are published. They are just uh, forgotten. Yeah, Marton, can you mention some concrete sources or or um, important phenomena in connection with Hungarian astrology in the modern period some towering names or uh, debates uh, of course no no secret that I'm thinking of uh, of uh, Baktai who wrote several handbooks of astrology and he was otherwise a very well-known scholar so how do you relate to these uh, developments um, yes um, there there is is one aspect that is uh, i think very um interesting um is the international connection uh of of uh, astrological life in hungary <clears throat> and it is it is not very well researched and there there should be international cooperation um between scholars because astrology came to hungary uh from the german-speaking countries austria and uh, germany um, mostly uh, Vienna and Berlin, and uh, there was also a very vivid connection uh, in the second half of the 20th, uh, uh, 20th century with the astrological life in um, Slovakia. And uh, as far as I know, there, there is no international um, communication or debate going on uh, in the question of um, 
of history of astrology in the 20th century um and there should be <clears throat> definitely but let's mention one more thing because you kind of very modestly did not mention your main research field which is actually early modern astrology and you wrote your PhD on uh, Matthias um, Corvinus is the Hungarian Renaissance Kings astrological circles and astrological knowledge which is a highly legitimate and very exciting research field and you duly earned your PhD on that but it's pretty fascinating that you move back to the 20th century and and look at these phenomena as well is there any connection um i would say not really the connection is the topic astrology okay i'm not forcing it but uh, certainly it's interesting that you are having two hats on your on your head Julia, your recent research is connected to Zilberer. Who was this Zilberer and what's his... Is, is there any connection to Hungary? Uh, there are some connections, actually. So, for example, uh, Hungarian psychoanalysts uh, knew the work of Zilberer and actually uh, some of them uh, found uh, his work extremely useful, like, for example, Leopold Sondi. Uh, but um, yeah, this is an ongoing research. I, I, I came across some Hungarian um, uh, uh, with some Hungarian sources recently, but I, I do believe that I will find more uh, on the uh, connections of, of Silver uh, to Hungary. But basically, uh, uh, I think this is. What maybe well known that Zilberer was a psychoanalytic thinker who was also involved in different forms of occultism in Vienna. And uh, actually he developed um, a, a huge and very interesting complex theory uh, on a kind of a collective unconscious. He did not use this term, but actually his theory is quite close to the Jungian theory of archetypes. No. Yes, I think that we are running out of time, but uh, hopefully this little interviews will be giving a taste of how many interesting things can happen in Hungary in the in the research of Western esotericism, how promising this field is, and that we have very talented uh, scholars to, to pursue these things. So thank you very much for the interview, and I will try to publicize it, and certainly we stay in contact and do a lot of things together. Thank you. Thank you.